Jalen, I want to be where you are. That looks nice. <laughs> yes, sir. It is nice out here. <laughs> where, I mean, well, where are you at? Just curious. What city? I'm in Lawrenceville, Georgia. Oh, okay. yes, sir. For, for the for the Fourth of July, though, I use I'm usually in Boone. Okay, no problem. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, well, we're all somewhere else right now, so that's no problem at all. So let's see how many other people I need to let in. Okay, here we go. Letting it all. Oops. Okay, we're all stepping in. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, seeing it all. Okay, I'm letting everybody in. Um, I should have just made the automatic admission, so uh, that's that's my fault. But while we're moving along, I'll, I'll just briefly state I'm kind of in a place where my internet is a little bit shaky. So if you find that I disconnect, um, if I don't reconnect within five minutes or so, just expect an email from me. I'll, I'll keep this short um, as a meeting goes. Um, I've, I've um, framed out a, an hour for this and it may not be more than that. So I just wanted to let you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm kind of like everyone else right now. I am recording this. So um, sometime this afternoon, you'll get this recording as well. And let's see, I'm almost, I think, let's see how many, I should have everyone now, let's see. I have We should have a few more people walking in in a minute. So having said that, I will go ahead and start and we will admit people as they come on in. First off, um, I want to welcome you all to Marketing Strategy. Um, I want to congratulate you all also for doing uh, something that's pretty tough, not only getting your MBA, but doing in the summer. Um, for, for any of you who've not done an MBA or have not done a second summer, in terms of recommendations that I would have, first of them is it's a really basic one. Um, don't get behind if, if you can help it, all right? Um, that, that can be a difficult thing. And so I would recommend that if you can, that you try to be able to work on a chapter every day. Um, it basically the chapters you'll find are all recorded and, and all of the chapters are basically set so that um, you'll be able to, you know, have time to look at them, to be able to review them. Now, the work that we're going to do, the work that we're going to do um, on, um, online in asynchronous is all going to be the chapter reviews, all right? So all of the chapters have been recorded. The testing, the testing is going to be on the chapters in marketing strategy from Kotler Keller. And if you notice, of course, I didn't choose all of the chapters. And if you also notice, I kind of mix and match the chapters in a way that um, uh, Kotler Keller doesn't. And the reason I do that is, is that I consider these particular chapters to be in a theme and I want to be able to work within that theme. So that's why you see them in a little mix match. Everything that's going to be on the test are going to be in the discussion that I have in the recordings and you can find them on your slides itself. The test, you will have a test every week and the test will start on noon Friday. Admitting one more person. 
All right, Jennifer, welcome. Come on in. Um, the tests will start on noon Friday and they'll end on noon Monday. And so the reason that I'm doing that is to give you the opportunity to use the weekend to be able to do your studies, okay? The work that we're going to be doing live online every week will be work that will require group interaction, okay? So what that means is that we're going to be learning how to do a case. So the work that we're going, you'll do in the recordings it is laying the foundations with two things. One of them is we're going to go back to the basics with some of the basic definitions of marketing. Um, we're also going to be working on certain tools that you'll need to use, like a SWOT analysis, a situation analysis. And then with that, ultimately at the end, each of you in your groups is going to work on a case. And the cases are from the Harvard Business Review, and they're pulled from real live situations happening at the moment that they're, um, that they're being done. As a rule of thumb, when you work on the cases, my recommendation is always, always when you're working on the cases, look at it in that moment in time when the cases are done. And, and the reason why, and I'll repeat this over so, so that you'll um, get it again. The reason why you do that is quite simply as many times the businesses, what they do in the future are the wrong things. And so you'll lose a perception and understanding if you try to move ahead a little bit in the future. You'll find most of these cases maybe five or six years in the past, but the situations that were posed are just as important today as they were then, okay? So what I'd like to do right now on the agenda is I would like to ask if each one of you would unmute yourself and I would like for you to introduce yourself. So I'd like you to do this. I'll, I'll call out your name so you know we can do these one at a time. I'd like you to give me your name and what you'd like to be known or called by. I'd like you, if you're working, I'd like you to tell me that or what you're currently doing. And then what are the reasons why you got your MBA and where you'd like to hopefully go with this? And without further ado, let me, excuse me, uh, let me find my list here, which I had just a minute ago. And so I'd like to start with Samuel. Samuel Biggs, would you please start? Sam on? Okay, we'll move on. Uh, Rebecca Bremer? Bremer. Hi, my name is Rebecca Bremer. I go by Rebecca. Um, I'm currently not working. I'm a full-time student and a full-time parent. Um, <clears throat> the reason why I got my MBA, why I'm getting my MBA is because um, eventually I'd like to start my own business. Um, I'm interested in doing something, I think, in the cybersecurity industry. Mm. And I, think, I think that answers all the questions. Is there anything that I'm missing? No, that's it. Thank you very much and welcome. No, that's it. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jennifer uh, Buff, is that correct? Um, yes, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're awesome. Go right ahead. Okay, great. Um, I currently work full time as um, a teacher in the College of Health Sciences at App State. Um, and I, my background is in uh, speech language pathology, but I'm mm. pursuing an MBA with an emphasis in business analytics. Um, and I'm doing crossover work with in the area of learning analytics as a research uh, path mm. um, and um, kind of hoping to market myself uh, with a bit of a hybrid um, bag of experiences for either higher ed administration or um, possibly flip to the other side of um, maybe reaching out to um, higher ed universities uh, from the position of a data scientist or data analyst for a company. Don't know yet. <laughs> well, that's, that's impressive. It's great to hear and good luck. I mean, uh, and certainly, yes, one of the things that you will learn while we're here, folks, is 
you learn how to market yourself, which is the most important tool that you have. Um, you'll be able to learn to refine your skills, find that segmentation of the market that you wish to go after, grab that target and position yourself. So yeah, welcome, good, good luck. Austin Chestnut, is that right? Uh, yes, sir. Please, uh, so uh, My name, uh, Austin Chestnut. Um, I just recently graduated from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill with a bachelor's degree in sports administration in hmm. December. Um, I'm looking to go into marketing, which is one of the main reasons I'm taking this class. I really just have a passion for just trying to uh, market myself as, and market other businesses. I would love to go into sports. Ultimately, my dream job will be working for like a sports company like Nike, Under Armour, something like that. Um, I'm not working currently right now. I'm just doing school and I also play on the Appalachian State men's football team. If you awesome. want to consider that some kind of job. Um, like I said, pursuing my MBA, I would just like to potentially start a business in the future, but I also feel like MBA is a good way to open yourself to a lot of job opportunities. You're, you're absolutely right. And it'll expose you to a lot of things that you haven't had before. I had Shamar, uh, in my class, um, a, two, three years ago. Um, yeah, I, you know, it's a wide open field. Sports marketing is, is there. It's for you to just go out and grab it and you're, you're in a great position. Good luck. Okay, so um, Robert, is it Con? I, I don't wanna butcher your name, Robert. Condon. Condon, okay, go right ahead. Yeah, my name's Robert, I go by Robert. Um, uh, why did, so I'm in the, yeah, the last semester of the MBA. I'm a full-time student, um, not working now. I've uh, been connected with um, Samaritan's Purse for many years. So I'm, the goal of the MBA is um, to get more exposure to for-profit private sector um, and ultimately uh, maybe to bring that back into the nonprofit sector. Uh, so there's an excellent article um, on this website that I may not have necessarily assigned, but it talks about the normative view of marketing. It was written by a professor that I knew many years ago. His name was Roban. And one of the things that he talked about is that marketing is not about how things are, but as how things should be. And one of the things that he also discussed is, is that the, the focus for profit or nonprofit organizations are essentially the same. I mean, you're doing the same things regardless of whether your business is designed to make a profit or not. And so you're gonna find that all the tools and the things that you need in marketing are gonna take you to a good place. So welcome. Thank you. All right, let's see, moving right along. Um, Chelsea, um, is it Gulliver, is that right? Yeah, like the book. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, my name is Chelsea. I go by Chelsea. Uh, I am currently unemployed. I was working full time as an operations manager for a local brewery here in Asheville because I'm currently in Asheville. Uh, and I'm pursuing an MBA because I my undergrad is in uh, macroeconomic theory and there were some jobs opened a few years ago in Washington State that kind of provided these public policy liaisons between the indigenous, the logging corporations and the, and the state itself. And it was with the idea to try to mitigate resource use in a way that's beneficial for all parties involved. And I just thought that was a really cool thing to do. So uh, one of the requirements of the job is to get an MBA and App State has a great MBA with a sustainable development. So awesome. that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, making money is not a bad thing. Um, <laughs> no. I, I read, I read um, this that um, in terms of a bachelor's degree versus a uh, regular income, you'll make something the fact of something over your lifetime, like six hundred thousand more dollars with a bachelor's degree than without one, and with an MBA, that figure goes to something like nine hundred thousand over the lifetime of your career. So wow. MBA as a payoff pays off, all right? It's as simple as that. You know, yeah. it, it, it separates you from others. So by all means, you know, um, pursue your dreams. That's what you're here for. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's see, where am I? 
Oh, I hate working on a small computer. Uh, Marie, please. Marie Heipel, please. Um, Marie is a colleague of mine. Uh, we worked in graduate APMP together, so go right Good ahead. morning, everybody. Marie Hopeful, and I go by Marie. Um, I do work full-time here on campus, and um, I'm actually not in the MBA program, but um, I, I've just recently started the MPA program here on campus. Um, also a really great program, I think, um, along with the MBA. Um, and I'm uh, pursuing the uh, nonprofit uh, concentration in the MPA program, which is public administration, if you weren't aware. Um, I'm doing this mainly because I'm just interested in it, but um, also as, you know, a possible um, post-retirement from the current job. Uh, I've, I've worked in nonprofit, uh, on nonprofit boards for a number of years and just real interested in that space and, you know, working with communities. So I, I don't know where this will take me, but um, and I, I definitely see marketing as a key part of working in the nonprofit environment. Great, it's good to see you. You, in the graduate program, you, you have no idea uh, how much Marie affected the quality of what you're doing right now. She was one of the, 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 the leaders in the graduate APMP. So um, thanks for joining in. I'm, believe me, I'm, I'm honored to have you here, Marie. All right, so let's see. Um, Samuel, I missed you. you uh, would, let me, let's go back and pick you up. Could Give me your name. Okay, yeah, I'm at a coffee house right now. The, my internet at my apartment decided to crash like 15 minutes right before class, so I am not much over here. So I apologize for all the background noise. I'm not I'm doing anything crazy. Um, but my name is Samuel Biggs. I'm also in the IOA Dream program as Kat, and I'm here to probably already mentioned. Um, I work for a company called NUFG, which was a Japanese bank. Um, and I did some of their HR talent and development stuff this past year. Currently, switched over. Um, I'm in Nashville working as an F45 personal trainer for the summer. And then in September, I'll be moving to Dallas, um, where I'll be working for PricewaterhouseCoopers as one of their management consultants. So uh, a lot of different jobs within these three months, but um, hopefully, I, I do believe the NBA will at least play a role. It played a role in getting the interview at Pricewaterhouse, so I'm sure it'll play a role in how we approach and how we work with clients going forward. Yeah, and it'll play a substantial role for you, Samuel, no doubt about it. You know, I mean, walking in with that sheepskin is a, is a major plus. Uh, Kylie, is that right? Is it Labe or is it? It's Labby. Labby, yeah. okay, uh, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Kylie Labby, I go by Kylie. Um, I'm in the MBA program with a concentration in HR. I'm currently working in Charlotte as an HR assistant. So that's been pretty nice. Um, I think the main reason why I wanted to get my MBA is it looks really good on resumes. Definitely a one up in interview process. Yeah. And uh, broaden my educational horizons, I guess. Yeah. I, I, and you'll find that there are, there are many serendip serendipitous qualities about having an, an MBA. And you're going to find yourself open to possibilities that you may not have ever considered. So I, I've never seen where education doesn't pay off. So it's a great step. So congratulations. Uh, Jordan, Lindsay, is that right? Yes, sir. Go right ahead, please. My name is Jordan Lindsay. Um, I currently work part time at Village Cafe in Blowing Rock as a server. And um, I decided to get my MBA because I wanted to have a more versatile degree where I had a lot of options with careers. And um, as far as when I graduate, I just recently uh, passed my real estate exam. So I'm kind of debating between going into real estate or finance. So that's where I'm at right now. Well, real estate's a great position, especially now and especially here. Are you planning on staying here, Jordan, or would you go somewhere else? Uh, well, I have an interview in Charlotte next week, so I'm thinking about moving to Charlotte when I graduate. Okay. Well, good luck, you know. Yeah, thank you. Horizons are open. It's great. Okay. Uh, Catherine Meyer, is that correct? Okay. 
Yes. So, please. Hi, my name is Catherine Meyer. Um, I go by Catherine or Cat. Either one's fine. Um, I am part of the dual IOHRM uh, MBA program. Um, and these are my last two classes uh, before I'm finally done with school, which I'm really excited about. Right. Um, and I'll be moving to Dallas to work for Jacobs Engineering Group, um, doing some HR for them. Um, the main reason I got my MBA was, well, my primary focus is really HR and psychology, um, but I also like to have a better understanding of the business side to be able to um, talk with business leaders and have a better understanding of how I can help them. Um, so the MBA has been really helpful for that. So, cause I have, I mean, marketing, finance, management, I don't really have a background in, so this has been super helpful. Yeah, I mean, yeah, IO is industrial organizational psychology. It's a great, great field. Um, a minor, when you get a PhD, you've got a minor and some kind of master's thing. And mine was, was uh, psychology. And, and yeah, the IO psych and the marketing guys are gals too, I should say. They're, they're very close together in, in what they do. So it's, it's a perfect, you know, thing for you, you know, so great. Wish the best for you. Thanks. You bet. Andrew Miles, is that correct? Andrew, are you on? Okay, no problem. Uh, we can go on. Andrea, how, how do I say your last name, Andrea? Mon Montoya, is that right? I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Andrea. Could you, is the mic, mic has an issue? Can you hear me now? Gotcha. Good. Sorry, I have to switch back and forth with my work and personal laptops, but it's Andrea, Andrea Montoya. Um, so I am also in the, I, or I just finished the IOHRM program with Kat and Sam. So we graduated in May and um, I'm working full time for Dexcom. So my background. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a company that uh, makes technology to help diabetics. Okay. And I'm working in the talent development and organizational development space. Uh, right now I'm focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So all of that is within HR. Yeah. Uh, and I'm doing my MBA um, just like Kat and Sam because most people don't know what IO psychology is. So that MBA kind of helps us out a little bit. Yeah. And understanding how organizations work really helps us um, leverage our psychology background and applying that to the business. You know, I should also state that HR is the lifeblood of any organization. I mean, the, the people that you hire is, is your success. I mean, it happens at the hiring. My, my brother is a recruiter and he works in Louisiana and it's the same thing. You know, the success of any organization is your carrying out the wishes of your company and finding talent that makes your company better. So good luck, it sounds great. Thank you. You're welcome. Jalen, I started with you, so now it's your turn. Jalen Virgil, is that right, Jalen? Jalen Virgil, yes sir. Okay. Jalen. Um, yeah, so I graduated from the, um, I graduated with the business management degree from App in December, 2020. Okay. Um, I'm currently not employed. I'm also a member of the football team with Austin. So I guess you get to ask the job as well. You bet. Uh, my reason for, you know, uh, being in the NBA program is because uh, we were granted an extra year of eligibility. So uh, right. with football, it's kind of hard, it's kind of hard to, um, to like seek internships. So I figured that having an NBA on my, on my resume would be the best way to go with the extra year of school. So I decided to join the program and, uh, you know, just really just work on all the different facets of business and just put myself in the best position, you know, knowledge wise. So, yeah, that that's so smart. You know, I mean, you could coast a year if you wanted to, but right. you're applying yourself. I mean, I give you all credit for that. That's that's brilliant, Jalen. You know, you. you'll do great. You know, Thank great, you. great. Yeah. Good luck. I really mean that. Thank and you. Joshua, you're the last one. I, my last name is Shao, so I was always the last kid in line. So I know what it's like to be in the last part of the line. So if you would, oh, yeah. go right ahead. Is it Josh, is that okay, by the way? Yeah, yeah, I go by Josh. Um, 
this is my uh, this is my last semester um, in the MBA program. Um, I'm not currently working. I'm close, well, hopefully close to having something lined up uh, for when I graduate down in Charlotte. Um, I actually got my bachelor's degree in marketing. Um, and then as far as why I'm getting an MBA, um, mainly just so to hopefully, yeah, uh, you know, open more doors for me um, yeah. professionally. You know, one of the things, thanks, I, I appreciate that. And thank you all of you for, um, for that as well. You know, one of the things I also wanted to kind of let all of you know, it, it, I started my PhD very late. I mean, I was 40, 45 when, and I was in IT and I was in essence aged out. I was just simply too old and making too much money. And I, I want you all to know, especially with an a NBA, everyone has a second act, all right? Just because your first act doesn't end the way you want to, your second act, you always have a second and a third and a fourth act. And I went into mine very, or let's just say later than most others, but there is no end point. So all of you have, are in some individual stage in, stage in your life and you chose to move forward. And, and that is to your credit. And I, and I just wanna end that particular conversation with saying that nothing is fixed, you know, nothing, is forever you can always move on and, and you're certainly showing that today okay okay so i'm going to briefly talk a little bit about marketing and i'm going to go through the the weeks as they go through and then we're going to end on a high note and you'll see this updated it depends on how long it'll take me for the the uh, internet to um, upload here so Without further ado, I want to talk, let's see, where is, okay. Let me first expand that out and let's see, come on you. Basically go through the weeks, okay? So if you look at the top of the website, you're going to find a lot of the cases that we're ultimately going to use. Next week when we meet, I will assign each of you into groups. And then I will also allow you to decide which cases you wish to um, pursue. Each one of these cases, by the way, are part of the um, Harvard Business Review cases. They come from actual corporations, ones that have had you know, serious issues or let's say a critical issue that needs to be fixed. And what you're going to do in your groups are, you're going to be in essence, what are known as the rainmakers. You're gonna come in and you're gonna define where the central or several issues are and ultimately come up with a plan to be able to get them out of that. So how are you gonna be able to accomplish that? Well, first we'll start off with the basics understanding of marketing. We'll move on to the marketing tools next week. We're actually going to do something of a case together and then eventually by the end of the semester, you'll be presenting a case online using either PowerPoint or Google, um, either one of those, okay? So if you notice, you have the first uh, four chapters talking about basics of marketing. Each one of these, by the way, is a recording and you'll notice the time that's involved for each one. Um, my suggestion is for you to download the PowerPoint slides to make notes on them at the same time, stop them and go forward whatever, in whatever way you want. As I said, the first test or the test starts Friday at noon and they end at Monday at noon. Now, the tests also are an hour and a half long. They are composed of 30 questions, multiple choice, and they will also be five essay questions worth eight points a piece. That's where you get your 100 points. What's the makeup of the question? Well, the questions will be either ones that are basic recitation of facts, like what is the difference between a need or a want, or they might be a reflective in which you'll have to take some given marketing concept and apply it to another different circumstance. And I split those questions equally between listing and reflective. And then I split those equally between the chapters themselves. So 
out of 30 questions, you might have seven or eight questions about each chapter. The essay questions can be either of those as well. The, the questions could possibly be a listing like name the five properties of an exchange, or they may have to do with some of the lectures like given this particular circumstance in marketing my myopia, is this true? And what you would do is reflect on the facts of that particular item and see how they pertain to this unique circumstance. So as I said before, you've got the whole weekend to study and that moves on with each week as well. So every beginning of every week, every Monday, we'll have a Zoom meeting at 10 o'clock, about two hours or so. This one will be shorter. And then for the remaining of the week, you can work on each one of the chapters and the chapters as we did on the first one, will start on Friday at noon and they'll end on Monday at noon. By the time we get into week four, we're going to be getting into the deeper parts of the subjects where we talk about product strategy, innovation and the essence of where innovation comes from. We'll talk about how do we address competition? How do we drive growth? How do we bring about new product offerings? And by the end of it all, we're actually believe it at the end, going to start talking about the four P's. It's funny that if you're in marketing, you think the four P's are the first thing in marketing strategy, believe it or not, it's the concepts of understanding reflective learning, diagnosis, diagnosis and synthesis, the being able to think those things are at the end, okay? The final is comprehensive and it's optional, all right? Your final, if you wish to take it, will replace your lowest grade. The final will be 50 questions, all multiple choice and all drawn from the chapters that you have um, or, or from the test that you've already taken. So once again, if you're fine with your grade, you do not have to take it. If you feel like you wanna be able to bump your grade up, it will replace it. There is no bad side of taking the, the comprehensive final. If your final is a bad grade, it doesn't replace any of the other grades, okay? It's your three highest test scores. The last week on August 2nd, we'll have a presentation of all three cases. And of course, I want everybody to join in on each one of the Zoom sessions, okay? Okay, so I don't know if any of you have looked at chapter one yet or started to get an idea or understand some of the marketing concepts, but marketing has gone through a very major revision over the 100 years that it started. Marketing originally as a discipline broke off from economics in 1923, and it had to do with the product classification of goods. And marketing as a discipline has evolved over many, many years. Marketing used to be about the most efficient way to provision and distribute goods. However, in the 50s, marketing became much deeper uh, when we started to see psychologists such as Festinger, um, Milgram, and those ideas borrowed from psychology, you might even say stolen, borrowed from psychology and you started to see the, in the 60s and 70s, the concepts of marketing changing. In the 70s, you started to see the first consumer behavior classes start to come in. You started to see channels maybe back out, but now channels are bigger than ever, especially when you consider the omni-channel. So Jag Sheff, who's one of the great marketing gurus says, marketing is a context-driven discipline. And as long as the context, context change, marketing will always new, be new. But the essence of marketing, the descriptions and the understandings of what it is will always remain constant. So there was many, many moons ago, a brilliant individual who brought marketing to where it is today and it happened with an article he wrote in the Harvard Business Review in 1960. Now, this will be something that you will see on your test. So the slides are online. 
if you wish to follow them, or as I said before, I'm recording this, you can follow this later, okay? So, In 1960, this seminal article was written by an individual by the name of Theodore Levitt. And Theodore Levitt is considered one of the great marketing gurus of all time. He was professor at Harvard Business School, editor of the Harvard Business Review. I don't know where you go from that. I mean, that's how high is up? He was up, okay? He was the Dean of Marketing there at Harvard, and he was the one who in the 60s taught, uh, coined the term globalization. Um, so he was a man, an individual, a marketing person above and beyond his times. And he wrote an article in 1960 called Marketing Myopia. And it is one of those things in whatever discipline that you're in, where everything changes after that moment. And so this was a paradigm shift that he brought in marketing, not because he changed marketing, but he gave a different way of thinking about it. And so what did he say in this article? All right. Well, what he said basically is that business managers tend to be very myopic in, in what they look at when it comes to their organizations. And so many times when we're in an industry you know, there's that very simple question that we ask ourselves, what are what business are we in, all right? It's a very important question. To be able to ensure our own growth, you have to be able to define yourself properly. And what he said was, is that businesses far too often uh, define themselves on what they sell versus who they sell to. And this is the whole concept of what myopia is. And so myopia as a definition means nearsightedness. Um, it can also have an esoteric definition, which means a lack of foresight or imagination. And what he's, his point was, is that there is the definition, or let's just say the propensity for us to focus on things that the true nature of marketing is not. And so what do I mean by that, okay? Well, here's some examples of industries that focused perhaps on the wrong thing, but then sometimes switched to the right thing before they finally went out. The railroads in the United States commanded a masterful kind of um, footprint, especially up until the 1940s and 50s. And the difficulty with the railroad industry is that they tend to think of themselves as the railroad industry instead of what they actually were, which was the transportation industry. Instead of focusing on the things that they did and the services that they provided, they focused on what they did. So Hollywood almost got to this issue where they did not, or they said to themselves they were in the movie business and in the 40s and 50s, you'll see a great fight within Hollywood, especially over television, because they looked at that as a threat. Well, Hollywood turned itself around and understood that they were in the, in the entertainment industry and that television in essence, all that it was, it was really a conduit to provide that satisfaction to consumers. And if you look at the modern definition now, whatever you use for streaming or whatever, the important thing to realize is whether it's a television whether it's the internet, and no matter no matter what it is, all those are are conduits to bring entertainment to you, and, and in that way, Hollywood survived. Of course, the petroleum industry is focused around the oil industry and not understanding its focus as being in the energy business, and so many oil corporations have suffered that. But if you notice, several of them even with the British petroleum fiasco, are starting to redefine themselves as being in the energy business. And, and that has brought a change significantly in the oil or in the petroleum industry. So one of the difficulties with that is that if you focus yourself on an industry or off on a product, then the difficulty was, is that there is the shadow of obsolescence. Now, 
generally when we talk about whether something is obsolete or not, we may not use the right word. Obsolete means that there's no purpose whatsoever for that particular good anymore. So something that is obsolete, an example is, is using whale bones for women's corsets. That would be obsolete. Obsolescence means that this particular item still works, but there's something that's simply better. In 2000, well, up till 2008, Microsoft owned 90% of the operating systems on any electronic computer platform, all right? They never felt the winds of obsolescence until Apple came along with the iPad and Google came out with Android operating system and they pulled the rug right out from Microsoft by changing the platforms in which people work on. And so they were unprepared for these threats and ultimately because they focused themselves along the computer industry versus focusing on their real product, which is to deliver information to consumers. And so what Levitt or thought up, okay, oh, I'm always fascinated by thought pieces, folks. I mean, he, he didn't, you know, he didn't do a study on this. He didn't do research. He didn't do the scientific method. He just thought this stuff up. And, and this, this is amazing. And so what he believed or what he brought out is what's called the self-deceiving cycle. And there are four points of this self-deceiving uh, cycle. The first is, is that growth is assured, all right? And that merely population is going to grow your corporation no matter what that you'll always be assured of profits based upon an uh, uh, expanding population. Well, the difficulty with that is, is that it limits your imagination. It, it means that you are not understanding or expecting the absence of a problem when there is a problem that might be there. And not only that, it's the absence of thinking. It, it basically says, well, there is no issue. I can just keep going on, all right? So that's the first one of the self-deceiving cycle. The next is, is that all we have to do is produce, okay? And that the drive of production is all you need to, to be successful. If you look in the 1940s, right after World War II, you find very much that the production mode of thinking was very much in vogue, that all you had to do is produce a good such as an automobile and the purpose of marketing was simply sell whatever we're making. Well, the problem with that is, is that it fails to reveal what consumers were wanting. It tends to be very product oriented and it doesn't look at the consumer as well, all right? Um, during the 60s, there was a very defined, um, what's the word I want to desire for a small efficient automobile. It was there. But the tendency was for Detroit was to produce larger automobiles that made more profit. Well, in 1964, uh, Ford came up with the Mustang. And the Mustang was thought to be what was considered that third automobile. So this is another concept that you have to understand. After World War II, you went from a one-car family, which everyone in the family used, to a two-car family. And what that meant was, is that the, the parents, the two parents had the vehicle and then the children would use those vehicles. In the 60s, you saw the advent of the three car family. And what that meant was, is that was two cars for the parents and then a third car for the kids to use. Well, the Mustang was going to be that third automobile. That was its purpose, all right? The Mustang is one of the most popular production models in history. But here's what they found out after the first two years. The first two years they found out that 60% of the individuals who were buying Ford Mustang were men and women between the ages of 35 and 50 who were using that for their, their daily commutes to and back from work. And um, the automobile industry failed to understand that consumers, that's what they really wanted. And so you had the problems in the 70s, ultimately into the 80s, but it took almost 20 years for the um, 
the automobile industry in the United States to finally pull out of this. Now, the truth is, is that they had a real individual back in the 1910s by the name of Henry Ford, who came up with a brilliant idea, and that was the Model T. So through the help of John and Horace Dodge, the Dodge brothers, by the way, he wanted to develop a $500 automobile. So how did he do it? Well, what Ford did was he said, I've got to find ways to be able to make this automobile so that it, that the average American family can afford it. And what he thought was $500 a year at that time was the average yearly income. So he was going to make this particular car. So the, um, the assembly line was already known in the United States and it was already you know, in vogue. But what Henry Ford found was that he actually went to the Chicago Exposition in 1896 and he found meat packing done there. But what he found was something unique. People weren't moving from one section to the next. People were staying where they are and they moved the goods to them. And so not necessarily the assembly line, but it was the conveyor belt that Ford brought into an innovation in terms of manufacturing. So that was the first thing they did. The next thing he did was he came up with standard or he was using standardized parts. In the late 19th century, most automobiles tend to be what you would call a match weapon. And, and what I mean is they built them one at a time. Well, in the 1840s and 50s, standardized parts were being used in weapons. And the reason that you did that was because if you had three broke weapons in a field, you could take the pieces out of those three weapons and build one weapon that works. So what Ford did was he made standardized parts. Every part would be the same. So he had those two innovations. And the last thing he did was he paid his factory workers 50% more than anywhere else. And that was something that the fact at that time at $9 a day, because he felt like the, man, the his workers should make just as much money or make enough money to buy their own vehicles. So I, I know I'm going on on this, but what I'm saying is, is that Ford, even though he, he was, came up with that famous saying, you can have every color you want as long as it's black. But what Ford was basically doing is considering the consumer first. Now, I want you to think about this. This is an important concept, all right? Ford didn't first think of the assembly line and the conveyor belt and all of those other things first and then come up with a $500 automobile. He dreamed of the $500 automobile and everything else came after that. And so what, he, what I mean by that is it is the big ideas. It's the goals are the things that drive you to create success, okay? So the small things are important because they steps get you there, but you gotta have the goal and the vision first. And that's ultimately what Ford had. And the, the big vision is that he was gonna satisfy consumers. Okay, so this also goes down into the dangers of R&D where you think that you've got all of these great ideas in research and development, and you're going to be able to produce whatever you want. But the problem is, is that those are controllable variables. And the truth is you're selling to uncontrollable consumers because consumers are unpredictable. You know, they're stubborn, they're finicky um, as my, Professor Dr. Alford said, you know, people are strange. And, and so no matter how good a vehicle that you have, and it doesn't really focus on the consumer, then it may not be doing what you want. Uh, Honda is one of these brilliant organizations when it comes to production. They use stainless steel calipers on the top of their valves. And even though that's a brilliant thing, does it reach the consumer? Maybe not. Well, Toyota, which is a another corporation they spend a lot of their time studying consumers and putting things in their production that that the consumers ultimately value like they have self-adjusting heads that last 300,000 miles in the vehicles whereas Honda does it slightly different and so the dangers of research and development is is that you're always going to focus on the things you can control without really focusing on the things And, and this is 
the basic problem is that consumers are, are treated in, as he said in the stepchild way all right the people aren't interested in the basic needs of humans or people you know you don't question customers that you don't ask the markets and there's more of excitement in the product than the customers themselves and this is where you get more minutia or fascination with the production and none of the things in, in marketing, okay? This customer satisfying process is vital. When you go out and you're in your industries, it's important for you to focus your outputs on what whoever your consumers are. And so sports marketing, it's important for you to understand and the desires of the people who want to go and the experiences that they want to have. The IO psych, it's important for you to be able to understand what are the goals and missions of the companies that you work for. Um, it's important because, you know, all of those things are not only introspective, but it is a way of solving problems. And so these are the things that Theodore Levitt talked about, okay? And the last thing that I'm going to leave with you today, because I, you know, I want to finish at this end, is he's a very passionate man about marketing and about people in general, and, and especially when it comes to the leaders and organizations. You have a vision, and you need to be able to take that vision and bring it to wherever you are. Remember that your followers are going to be your customers and you're going to want to be able to express to them in some way that satisfies a need that, that you wish to solve. I love this second bullet that he says, it's important for you to understand that you're not producing products, but you're providing customer value satisfactions. And, and think of it every day, you're going out and buying customers. How do you buy customers? You exchange those with them things that satisfy the customers and bring them experiences which make it better at the end, all right? And the final thing I'm gonna leave, leave each one of you with is a leader and all of you have to know where you're going because if you go down any road, you might as well stay at home, okay? Okay, folks, thanks for hanging with me. The internet never went down. I appreciate it. Thanks for the, the introductions. Um, if you need me at any time during the week, if there's any problem with the videos or anything like that, please let me know. Um, is there anything else I can do for y'all before I go? I have one question if you don't mind. Sure, Austin, go ahead. Um, I saw the required reading on the syllabus and I also heard you talk about the read, um, the lecture videos as well as the PowerPoint. So I was wondering, do we need to go ahead and buy that book off of the website or can we just go based on the PowerPoint presentations and videos? You know, um, I don't work for the bookstore, okay? Um, and I'm gonna tell you right now that I developed this class solely self-contained. Now, I edited the Kotler Keller book. I love the book, it's a great book. And if you want a book textbook to take with you for the rest of your lives, I mean, that explains marketing concepts, I urge you to buy the book. Now, I think you can find that book on Amazon for like 15 bucks, all right? So, I mean, like I said, I don't, I don't work for the bookstore, I work for you. So you spend the money in the best way you know how, okay? My recommendation though, if you wanna carry a good book with you for the rest of your life, that's the one to carry, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Marie, did you have a question? Yeah, quick question. Um, so as far as um, group work, we don't need to worry about that for the next week? That's correct. You know, the, the, the first week, um, you're going to be going through the first four chapters and, and they're going to be talking about basic marketing concepts. So next week we'll start, I'll start doing group interaction. If, if any of you, by the way, have any questions about that, please email me at any time um, about that as well. And we'll start talking about the group app, group activities next week. We'll also, we'll go through a little, a couple of exercises where we'll start to loosen up the mental wheels a little bit. Um, but 
that's happening next week. This week, it's just all about getting comfortable in your chairs right now for the summer. Great, thanks. You bet, thanks, Marie. Anything else? Well, pleasure to meet all of y'all. Um, I hope you have a great summer. I'm available at any time. I, I, you know, I am very impressed with all of you. Just keep going. It sounds like you're you're doing great. And if you need anything at any time, um, please let me know. Okay. All right, folks. Have a great day. Go out and have fun. Get away from your computers. It's a beautiful day. Okay. <laughs> Thank See you. You bet. Bye bye.